Well, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, what may be the last dividing for a little lying for a little while, at least with me sitting here. I don't know. We'll see. I'm not sure if you have contact. John Sampson's coming in next week. Oh, all right, good. I'm going to be up with uh, Jason Wallace at uh, the OPC Church in Salt Lake City this weekend. Uh, if you're going to the Building Tomorrow's Church Conference, uh, we'll be speaking there. And uh, then uh, driving up. I'm actually sort of looking forward to the drive up Salt Lake. When was the last time that we would have done that? I mean, that was, that was, a, had to have been the 90s. Yeah, yeah, had to have been the 90s. I mean, uh, remember, remember pushing the, um, the, the Beetle? Uh, around the Motel 6 parking lot. <laughs> I had to get that thing running. Yes, I, I actually do remember that one. That one would have been my one of my first trips. Actually, I think we we took my truck that time. Remember the blue truck that well, broke down? That broke down, down coming down uh, I-17, yeah. yeah coming in the, oh, yeah, it was fuel middle, pump, wasn't it? Middle of the night, fuel pump goes. We got uh, six people in that thing because uh-huh. we had them in the camper uh-huh. in the back. Bought this $100 camper shell. <laughs> And then built a platform for people to lay down on. Oh, that was comfy. That was comfy. Oh, man. (laughs) Oh, man, yeah. Well, and of course, even before then, uh, (laughs) mid-80s, 80-45, Mike and I in the Dodge Dart that had so many holes in the floorboard. See, I never saw the Dart. My wife still has nightmares about it, actually. She she reminds me of that every once in a while. Remember that thing you had? (laughs) No two body parts were the same color. That was terrible. It's like, yes, dear, thank you. Uh, but uh, there were so many holes in the floorboard underneath that the wind would just come straight in on your feet. We had to stop at uh, at the dam up there, and Mike had to find socks uh, to put to to try to cover his feet because he was his feet were freezing down there. And oh yeah, yeah, that was those were the days, man. So I'm I'm looking forward. To uh, I'm looking forward to two things when I go to Salt Lake. First of all, there's this um, there's this drive-in place in Kanab, Kanab, Utah, where remember we'd stop there because it's a pretty long drive from there to Flag. And in fact, it was right after that we did we were playing that chess game. Remember we played the chess game over the CBs. Well, you you did that. That was not. Me, that, yes, I, I realized that, that, that but yeah, but yeah I, I was actually playing chess with the uh, with the car that was driving behind us, um, and I didn't have a board because I was driving, so I did it. I was doing it all in my mind. That was if I recall correctly, you still won. No, 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 no. I lost the position because we had a real close passing incident. Because <laughs> <laughs> there were <laughs> my life flashed before my eyes. Lost the position in the game. Oh well, <laughs> there were a few. Uh, <laughs> there were close folks. calls oh, along the way. Were, yeah, no two ways about it. Um, but there was this, remember that drive through where, uh, drive in type thing. I don't know what it was, but that's where we'd stop and we get something to eat in there in, in Kanab. So I remember chicken fingers there. So I'm going to see if it's still around and get chicken fingers. And of course, even Jason, uh, confirmed, uh, taco time is still in Salt Lake city. And so I'm going to be able to, for the first time in about four years, have a crisp meat burrito. Um, which I understand has about 1,400 milligrams of sodium per burrito. <laughs> I was going to say it's probably more like the per ounce. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It's I'm going to have to do some serious riding that day just to make up for uh, that one trip to taco time. But, but it has to be done. It has to be done. Anyway, um, so we're going up there and we're doing we're doing stuff the whole week basically. Starting Tuesday night on, um, I guess it's the last night the TV twenty is going to be allowing them to do their stuff. We'll be on uh, we'll be Tuesday night, so we'll be on then. And of course, by then the Supreme Court will have profaned marriage. I, I mean, after today's decision, does it is is anyone really questioning? I mean, words have no meanings. Laws have no meanings. History has no meaning. Uh, we are we are in, the only thing that hasn't happened yet for 1984 to be completely fulfilled is that the totalitarians ha- are being down our doors and dragging us away and sticking rat cages on our faces. That's uh, that's that's the only thing left, and and that's the next step. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, so. It'll happen between now and Tuesday, so I'm sure we'll have something to be talking about. 
<clears throat> at that particular point in time. And um, so, anyways, if you're in the Salt Lake area up there in Utah, I look forward to seeing you there. Um, that will be um, that will be a good time. Um, I had this text up last week, and I'll just go ahead and and mention it uh, in passing here. We're opening the phones at 877-753-3341, 877-753-3341. What? Oh, did you just tell somebody we weren't? No. Oh. Oh, the microphone got in your way. Okay, all right. You just looked perturbed uh, for some reason when I started saying we're going to open the phones. It's like... Uh, you know, we used to have Skype even, but, you know, we're making it more simple now. So 877-753-3341 is the phone number. Uh, yeah, someone in channel does not want the rat cages. Hey, I'm, I'm with you on that, but uh, room 12, room 12 with you. Uh, we just need to start memorizing some of that stuff. Hebrews 11.13 has a phrase that I really think I, I mentioned on Twitter is going to become more and more and more meaningful to us because I don't know that we've been living it. We, we may have, in a, in a sense, um, recognized its general truth. But it says, All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Strangers and exiles on the earth. Now, strangers is xenoi. It appears a lot in the Greek Septuagint as a foreigner. As uh, the one that is that is not an Israelite. One that is uh, dwelling in the land, but it is not. they are not a part of that culture, that people. Um and the other term is not nearly as as prevalent or uh, utilized uh, in in the Greek Old Testament. There are a few places where it is found, but not not too many. And uh, well, it's only found two places: Genesis twenty three four. Uh, I am a uh, sojourner and foreigner among you. So notice in both places. There's sort of the Hebrew parallelism, repetitive type thing. Blah. I don't know why he does these things. I really don't. You know, but that camera used to be aimed at him, and now it's sitting right there and it's zoomed in, and the remote is missing, so I can't zoom it back out. Yeah, he's got it in the other room. Yeah, uh huh. Because I would go, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, and. The same thing in Psalm 38. Uh, I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. And so um, both terms being used in, in parallel fairly uh, frequently. That text in Hebrews talks about those, you know, they went, they went long before us. And, you know, we, when I preach through Hebrews, we talk about, you know, the recognition they had that, they had not received the promises and stuff like that. But let's let's be honest. Um, a lot of us have become very, very comfortable here in the West. We have uh, all the food you could ever eat. In fact, uh, half of us sit around trying to lose weight because we have so much food. Um, we have doctors and we have amazing drugs that can do wonderful things for us um we're, we're pretty comfortable we've got our you know i live here in arizona and uh, like i said in the last program the, the pope says this is evil but um i'm i'm awful glad that we have air conditioning here in um uh, in the studios right now most of our equipment really would not be functioning if we didn't um but uh we have we have a lot of comforts and it's really easy to get, it's really easy to view this world as our home. And the Lord has ways of reminding us that that is not the case. And as I look around at the world today, as I listen to the world and how it's thinking, I go, I, I don't belong here. Um, this is This is completely outside my my area of even understanding how people can think this way, view the world this way. 
and and part of it is is I feel extremely sorry for people who have the worldview that that is leading to the moral and ethical insanity that is illustrated every single day. It's it it, it my my daughter actually posted something on Facebook. I didn't bring it up, but she was saying basically the same thing that that what has happened to our culture that we're all a bunch of babies now. I mean, when you have on college campuses, you have special rooms where you can go safe places with with toys to play with and graham crackers and milk and you can take curl up and take a nap and have your banky. I mean, really? Uh, it, it is institutionalized infancy. And I said in response to her, I said, well, yeah, the totalitarians, uh, they, they want, it's a whole lot easier to, to control a society filled with children than a society filled with adults. And all this stuff about, you know, I'm just offended by everything. I am offended by everything. It's just all around us. Absolutely all around us. It is... <sighs> I, I, I don't even don't even know where to go. But having confessed, uh, and that's the standard term for confession, hamalageo, having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, and how did they confess that? By being strangers and exiles, by not loving the things of this world, by not adopting the ways of thought of this world, by not by not being willing to abandon their 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 belief in God so as to pursue the the things of this world and we are going to be called upon to confess in our society i i i can see it coming where you are you know in the early church you had to offer the pinch of incense upon the altar and say caesar is lord well there's lots of easy ways to force us to take a stand on the key issues today. And the question is, will we do it? What will we do when our, you know, it's real easy. To, we've talked about this in church history. It's real easy to look back and go, wow, oh, that, that persecution really caused problems in the church. And what would we have done if we had been facing the same situation and all the rest of that kind of stuff? And uh, now it's coming for us. And now we really realize, you know, some of you thought I was a little bit harsh on on dear brother Dave Hunt many years ago because he would go after people in the church. He'd go after Augustine or even in the Reformation period. And he showed no understanding that he himself lives in history and that he himself will be judged by history and that there are going to be people looking back upon him. And when you realize that makes you a little less willing to be uber harsh to everybody else from the past. And, you know, I, I the, the same thing is here is it's real easy to look back and sort of clinically go, well, the early church did this in response to this kind of pressure and this kind of persecution here. And, and this happened there. And, now that we're getting there, all of a sudden you realize how complicated it is. Looking from the looking you know, hindsight's 2020. It's real easy to see what happened and should have done this, should have done it's real easy to make those kind of judgments. Not so easy when you're in the situation yourself. And um it's gonna be it's gonna be a challenge. It is going to be a challenge. We're gonna le learn a lot about ourselves and um, a lot about the grace of God. But I am, I am thinking a lot about if we are strangers and pilgrims, if we are not to be comfortable, then what does that look like? And what does that mean to how I am to think and how I am to respond? And when the decision comes down tomorrow, uh, Monday, Tuesday, whenever it is, um, how am I to respond to that? I mean, it's one thing to to righteously be indignant at the foolishness of of our our society today and its self destructiveness and and everything else that that that's fine. But 
I can't live every day in this constant state of angst or anger or disgust. Um, I, I have to come to recognize that this is where God has called me to be. This is his plan. And therefore, I am to embrace that and seek his will and to seek to be the best servant of his that I can. And what that, what's that going to look like? Well, there are certain things it's going to look like for all of us, but there are also specific things it's going to look like for each individual because we're each called to different different place of service. And so it's going to take wisdom. We're going to have to be in the word. We're going to have to be much less distracted with all the silliness of this world. And man, there is a lot of that. Um, it'll be a purging thing. It'll be a purging thing. There's no two ways about it. Um, Having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, we're going to be feeling that for 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 real here uh, in um, in probably just a matter of hours. I mean, I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, but it's coming, and um, we'll be thinking about this text eight seven 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 five three 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 four one. So I've got a call from Australia. Probably need to go to go to that first, uh, and so let's. Uh, Drop down, down under, and talk to Ben in uh, Australia. Uh, there we go. Ben, how you doing? Hi. Hi, Dr. White. Yes, sir. Uh, how you doing? All right. Don't worry about the cost because I'm getting it free through Google. Okay. Well, um, I'll just go back to somebody else then. No. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Um, I've got a question about John chapter 5, 31 to 47, because I've been reading it in... Um, like, because I've actually been listening to um, you uh, present against Dave Hunt, um, and it says about you don't, um, uh, was it you do not have his living word. Yeah, you do not have his living word. This is the thirty-eight, because you do not believe the one he sent. Is this linking? Is this linking into when John? Uh, does this link into John six where it goes? Um, is it? I think John six, where it says about no one can come to the Father except he who. The, uh, no well, which well, well, I'm, I'm sorry, which which verse were you referring to? Um, thirty eight. Um, you do not have His word 30, abiding in you, for you do not believe Him whom He sent. Yeah, and does that link? Does that that passage link in with um, where it's uh, John six in the sense of? Um, he's saying about search, um, yeah, my head's a bit all over the place, but yeah, I'm trying to think, he's well, saying about, you do not know me, and, um, is a test, the witnesses, you don't accept the witnesses yet, um, and then John 6 says, you, yeah, I, I'm using a, uh, yeah, John, I'm trying to think of, yeah, the four witnesses to Christ. Is what I'm up to in John five. Well, there, and, there's there's a slight difference between John five and John six in that John five yeah. is primarily focused upon the Jewish leaders, and John six yeah. is simply the people in the synagogue. So it's not quite the same. Uh, there, there's obviously more in John five about holding these individuals accountable. For example, five thirty nine says, "You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life." So. These are people yeah. who have a lot of revelation from God. They possess the scriptures. He can talk about the testimony of Moses and so on and so forth because these are people who are professing to know the word of God. Um, and yet they remain dead in their sins uh, because they do not believe him whom he has sent. They are rebelling against the very one that's fulfilled the prophecies that, that are there in scripture. Um, in verse 42, it says, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. Um, that is, and then verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? So each one of these statements is a, uh, a stinging, uh, analysis and, um, explanation of the unbelief of the Jews in light of the revelation that they have received. And that's not really the emphasis 
in in John 6, in John 6, you have people who are actually seeking after Jesus, but for the wrong reasons. So John 5 is people who are rejecting Jesus just straight out, even in light of the great revelation and light that they have. John 6 are people that are willing to follow him. I mean, they want to make him king. Uh, if he'll just keep providing them with the free meals, you know, they'll be his army, the whole nine yards, but they don't recognize their spiritual need of Jesus. So there is a, uh, very frequently I think people miss the, the fact that there is a difference between John 5 and John 6. Uh, the issue of unbelief, deadness and sin, that's not any different, but uh, the emphasis is is different between the two. And uh, so you you get a little more information about one group than uh, than you might in the other chapter, so on and so forth. But um, there is a there is a difference between between the two. Thanks. That helpful? Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah, it is because it it was just interesting because I'm here like some of the words I was reading in John um, five got me thinking on John six because of just the just the hardening of the heart was the thing I was. Well, sure. I, I mean, you, all the way through John, you have. Uh, consistent themes that are developed in one way or the other. I mean, once you get to John chapter 9, you've got another instance of the blindness of those who claim to see versus the seeing of those who were blind. And, and again, it has to do with the amount of light they've had. Uh, there's, there's, there's lots of themes uh, that John has woven together that sort of come together in John 17, which sort of becomes the, the hub that ties all these, these themes together. Um, but there are differences between them, and it's it's yeah. interesting to note that. Okay? Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. God bless. Bye. Bye. All right. Let's go to another Ben, but he's not quite as far away. Wisconsin isn't nearly as far away as Australia. So, Ben, what can we do for you? Dr. Wade, how are you doing? Doing good. Got a question. Um, he's just 2, 8, 9 in the Greek. This is what um, this verse, studying this in the Greek, has got me to uh, think about regeneration prior to faith. I was always on the basis of it happens at the same time. And the reason this comes out in the Greek here, which is kind of, I might have to switch my view on this, is because you have the word grace in the feminine, the word has, or the uh, participle has been saved in the masculine, and faith in the feminine, but then you have the two toe, which is neuter. Right. So I've read a lot of articles by um, Dr. Wallace and other Greek people on their opinions on this. Um, He's a Greek this, people now. In your opinion, the two toe, is that referring to all three, or do you think that's referring to salvation? Well, as I um, as I laid out in the Potter's Freedom on this section, um, I believe that the neuter tuta is functioning as it does very often. Uh, as a uh, summary of the entire phrase beforehand. So uh, that not of yourselves is a gift of God would refer to everything in the preceding phrase, which is why it is neuter rather than seeking to uh, grammatically uh, match a particular element of the preceding section. So grace is not of ourselves it's a gift of god salvation is not of ourselves it's a gift of god as is faith which is why paul can in philippians 129 likewise say it has been granted to you not only to believe in him but to suffer for his name um so in just an easy passing way uh he can speak of of the granting of the ability to believe um and you put all that together with 1 John 5, 1, and the fact that uh, I, I think if you look carefully at the parallel syntactical constructions in 1 John 2 and 4, again, this is all in the Potter's Freedom, um, you see it's pretty tough to avoid the conclusion that what is being said in 1 John 5, 1 is that the work of regeneration is what makes the continuation of faith uh, the that's the result of that, that work of regeneration, not the other way around. So uh, I think there are a number of indications of that, uh, just simply in, in statements that are made in passing, all of which recognizes what Ephesians itself was saying in Ephesians chapter one. 
uh, that these blessings have been granted to us in Christ Jesus from eternity past and that we are the direct objects of his electing grace, not Christ, and then we get into Christ and therefore we become uh, the direct objects. The, the direct objects in the language are us, and um, that then becomes the foundation of, of everything else that Paul says. So it's, uh, it is a consistent uh, a consistent way of seeing what the scriptures are testifying to. Okay, so then those who hold to um, being saved as what Paul is referring to here with this, probably more of a theological interjection rather than exegetical? Well, if someone says that Tuta is only talking about Sesos Menoi, well, how do you substantiate that? Um, <laughs> you know, when you have when you have a neuter Tuta following a phrase, and and Kai is functioning to introduce that that sort of uh, apposition, that that restating of the phrase, that not of yourselves. Um, I don't know how you make the argument that it. I mean, I suppose it's a theological idea that, well, yeah, salvation is from God, and faith is our part, and I guess I don't know what you do with grace, but it, it seems rather clear to me that the whole point is that you're trying to get, you have uk ex humon, not of ourselves, then uk ex erga, not of works, um, and it again then ends up paralleling, paralleling 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, for by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, so that if anyone boasts, let him boast in the Lord. It's it's all um, it's all a, a regular part of uh, of Paul's exhortation to believers to recognize the centrality of, of God's grace in all things. Cool, excellent. Thank you very much. I was wanting to ask you this for some time now, so thank you. All righty, you're most welcome. Thanks. Yep, bye bye. Eight seven 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 five three 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 four one. And let's talk to Robert. Hi, Robert. Hi, how are you? Doing good. Um, I, I appreciate your work, um, and I've read a couple of your books, so I, re I really appreciate them. But I want, I want to uh, give you a little bit of background. I used to be a member of Worldwide Church of God, oh, yeah. and as a member of Worldwide Church of God, I, I uh, believe um, in annihilationism. So I'm actually looking to... Um, to gain church membership, and I know that the group that I'm fellowshipping right now um, has eternal torment on the uh, statement of beliefs, so I don't know if it's going to be an issue or not, but I'm still kind of, like, stuck in between <clears throat> annihilationism and eternal torment, and there's two major reasons why. One would be the, the language that's used in the Bible to describe um, eternal punishment, um, including, like, destroy, destruction, um, perishing, and, like, the second death. And then the other issue would be that it, um, it seems like the final state of a person who isn't saved is going to be, thrown, to be thrown in the lake of fire, which is going to be covering the earth. But it sounds later like the earth is refinished and that God's dwelling place is going to be here. So I guess what I'm wondering is, in that scenario, where do the unsaved that are being eternally tormented go to? If you could help me kind of try to figure out these questions, I'd appreciate it. Well, I, I've never heard, honestly, uh, of the idea of the lake of fire covering the earth. That's a, that's a new one on me. I had never, I had never heard that before. Um, so... I've never thought of responding to that because I don't see any reason why it would be viewed that way. Um, I, I don't see where in Scripture it says that the lake of fire covers the earth. So I, I don't know how to respond to that because that's that's a that's a novum for me. Um, okay. I mean, other than to say I don't see any evidence that that's the case, and so I don't see it. That's a actually a, a meaningful argument to say. Well, and then since the earth is renewed later on, that means that must be gone and. So on and so forth. Um, this this issue is um, I, I don't want to become the apologist for hell. Um, I I just I wish that there was someone who would uh, step up and do what needs to be done. Uh, there there are some there are some books out there um, that seek to accurately handle this and put it in its proper historical 
context and, and stuff like that. Um, there, but there needs to be more work done uh, in in the area. There needs to be more modern work done in the area, especially I think from a reformed perspective. Um, a lot of the stuff that's out there isn't necessarily thoroughly uh, reformed in its in its outlook. But I, I don't know what uh, what group you're talking about fellowshipping with and what they necessarily mean by eternal punishment. Generally, the issue is uh, is the punishment of the ungodly um, limited in its time time span, so that the the punishment is a finite punishment, um, which assumes a cessation of sin. In other words, the uh, vast majority of people, just in the way they think about the subject of punishment, automatically assume that at the cessation of physical life, uh, somehow we become neutral. Uh, we stop sinning. And yet, from my perspective, the only way anyone can stop sinning is through an extension of, of grace and divine power and a changing of their nature. And I see no evidence that a, a rebel sinner, uh, simply because their heart stops beating, that on a spiritual level, uh, that the, the, the center of sin and rebellion is not in my physical body in that sense. It's not, it's not a function of my corpuscles or anything else. Uh, it is a spiritual thing. It is a is the result of a fallen nature that is in love with its own lusts and so on and so forth. So there has to be some understanding uh, that if the punishment for sin is finite, then what about the continuing relevance of the rebellion of the ungodly? In Revelation chapter 6, for example, you have at the end of the chapter when, when God's wrath is being... Uh, poured out in the yeah. in the seals and the bowls and so on and so forth. Um, when God's wrath is coming against the kings and and the powerful people and the little people of the land, everything else, what do they do? Do do they repent? Uh, do do they draw back? Do they say, "Wow, we we need to have a way of being right with God"? No, they they call upon the rocks and the hills to fall upon them to hide them. From the wrath of him who sits upon the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. And so, even in the context of knowing that God has, in fact, extended mercy and grace in the Lamb who stands as if slain, they do not repent, even in the midst of their pain and agony, but only seek a way out from it. So, what would be the basis, in light of that, of thinking that once someone is under the punishment of God, that the result of that is going to be a cessation of sin, a desire to do what's right before God, repentance, or anything else. Because everything in the Bible tells us that's not how man responds. Instead, man responds by blaming God and hating him all the more. So I, I think that uh, what needs to, to be developed more, as I have certainly thought about this issue, is the nature of of the punishment, and I think we need to uh, get away from the medieval Dante vision of uh, demons running through uh, fiery corridors, skewering people with pitchforks and things like that. The, the, the picture that is given to us by Jesus is of a very lonely existence, of a uh, outer darkness, not not people sitting around having a good time together or uh, anything like that. Um, there is a there is a darkness and a weeping of na and gnashing of teeth. There's nothing about God having to uh, extend energy to torment people because, as far as I can see, the nature of the punishment that is experienced is due to the fact that you have an image bearer of God that hates anything that testifies of God's existence. And so once you're put in a place where there's no longer any way that you can even express that rebellion and hatred of God outside of self 
destructiveness. Um, I think that's what the nature of the punishment is, is it's, it's internal. It's not something that comes from the outside. It is, it is the full removal of restraint and the self-destructiveness that comes from that. Now, someone might argue, well, if that's the case, there would, be, since we're finite beings, there would eventually be an end to our own self-destruction. Um, and I, I, you know, I hear that. I understand that kind of, of, of mindset. Um, but at the same time, I don't know how you would be able to defend the idea of the necessity of the fulfillment of God's holy nature in the punishment of that continuing rebellion if there is no end to that rebellion. Um, it may be limited as to how it can be expressed, but... I've never had anyone explain how you get around that problem. That, um, th at least from an understanding of the necessity of the fulfillment of God's justice at that point. Again, most people have not struggled with these issues. Um, I certainly right. understand why people want to not affirm the eternal punishment of the wicked mainly because I think I think a lot of it has to do with how it's presented I mean in most people's minds the wicked are these poor innocent individuals well not innocent but individuals who did a certain amount of wrong for a short period of time and a lot of people have pointed out what well, yeah but it's it's the you know the seriousness of the sin in regards to whose honor has been uh, uh, attacked here and and the the insanity of the rebellion of the creature that is so dependent upon God and yet spits in God's face. I, I hear all of that, but still you're talking about eternity here. And I, and I don't know, and nobody else knows how time is experienced after, after the judgment. I don't know. Uh, if, if it's any different than how we experience it now, how could that even be expressed to us? How could that even be explained to us? I don't know. Yeah. I, I have no, no earthly idea. Um, so I could wish that annihilationism was true. I really could. It would, uh, it would make a lot of things easier, but it seems to me to strike at the very, uh, at the very heart of one of the issues that I raise all the time with the Muslims. And, and that is the necessity of the complete fulfillment of God's law and it seems to assume that there there can be a cessation of rebellion and sin on the part of a non-redeemed individual. I mean you'd have to basically say we stop being human. Uh, we, we, we have to stop being human and become something else uh, once we die so that you can have that cessation or something like that. I, I, again, I fully understand the the desires on the part of individuals to avoid what might be called a uh, well a, a Dante ish view of a vengeful God who's just enjoying torturing people. But I think if you really seriously think through what the nature of punishment would be, uh, a lot of those objections go by the wayside. the The real question is, um, why do we have, you know, the, the smoke of their torment going up forever and ever? Do we have to, is there nothing there at all that, that indicates that this is a, a true indication of God's wrath against sin and the nature of the is there by being punished? It's not just a, a bull or a goat or something like that. It's one that actually bears the nature of the, the um, is that not there? Those are some of the issues that I think we have to think through. So I realize a lot of churches have that in, in their confessions of faith solely by tradition and not because of any meaningful uh, conviction or having really delved into it and thought about it. And I, I think it's something that has to be thought of very carefully. 
Um, I am concerned, to be honest with you. You mentioned, you know, you're, you're coming out of a group that isn't known for its its orthodoxy over history. I mean, I was I was one of the first people to speak at the Worldwide Church of God after the big change back in the 90s. I, I was one of the first people to lecture on the Trinity in a large congregation oh. on Long Island. So I was willing to walk right in there and say, if you want to know about the Trinity, let me teach you about the Trinity. Um, so no one can, can you know throw some stones at me about that. But at the same time, the vast majority of theologically oriented annihilationists have had other issues, shall we say, uh, when it comes to theology. And, you know, I asked the question, why is that? Um, and that concerns me as well, that I've seen people go that direction and then they they get wonky in other areas as well. Uh, so um, it, it's, but but I'm not, I'm, I'm hopefully you're hearing that I'm, I don't have just a knee jerk reaction about it. I'm not, I'm not going to shoot somebody in the head that, that struggles with it. Um, it concerns me, um, and I'm I'm not convinced by the argumentation that I've heard thus far. But at the same time, um, I I think most people who hold to confessional positions on it rarely know why and have rarely thought through the reasons why. They just go to certain yeah. certain texts and go, oh well, there it is, and go on from there without really seriously thinking through what some of the issues uh, really are. So, I don't know if any of that helps you at all or not. Well, I just want to tell you, um, as far as my theology goes at this point, I'm pretty well reformed, and as far as I know, I don't hold any other weird doctrines besides um, annihilationism. And with me, it's more ma it's not a matter of emotions, it's more the, that I see the language in Scripture that seems to indicate finality and I can't get past that, but I can also see the points on both sides. I can see the Lazarus and the rich man parable, as well as the, uh, the, the, the references you made in Revelation. So it isn't like I'm choosing <laughs> to, uh, or that my emotions are affecting this at all. I'm totally sola scriptura, mm -hmm. um, so that's where I am with it. Um, I also know that John Stott um, apparently believed in annihilationism. So well, he's yeah, he did. From yeah, what I understand. Yeah, he, he did, and I, I would I would assume that probably a majority of what calls itself New Testament scholarship today does actually believe in annihilationism. But that's not so much because of the weight of the argument as a dislike of the alternative. Um, and for a lot of people in the academy, it's just a, it, it's, it smacks too much of fundamentalism. Um, so it's, it's sort of like the vast majority of New Testament scholars would never believe in the doctrine of inerrancy either, because it, it's not going to, it's not going to fly within that context. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say a majority are actually in that position, but I I don't think that that carries a lot of weight because there's all sorts of other things that there would be very hesitant to affirm that I would have to affirm as a central doctrine of the faith um, that that they're much more concerned about how they would do that and still fit in. So, yeah, but he did, and uh, there are there are others. Uh, Philip Edgecombe Hughes is another one um, that was a conditionalist or annihilationist as well, and yet his commentary on Hebrews is great. So, um, I, I'm I'm not I'm not prepared to send someone, <laughs> uh, ironically, to the fires of hell um, if they have a problem with this particular issue. I'm I'm just not convinced of it, and I I think it it's normally part of a, a complex of other issues that frequently point us to some other problems that might exist. Yeah. Also, one quick question. As far as your Q&A book on Islam, um, I noticed that it's been put back, um, apparently. So so can you tell me when that's going to be available? Also, if you had to pick one commentary set, would Pillar be a good one for New Testament? And that's all I'll ask. Yeah, Pillar's got some good stuff. Look, when you're talking about any commentary set that is multiple authored, you, you get what you pay for, and that's one of the problems in buying them as a set. 
you know, the word biblical commentary, there are certain volumes that are really good. There are others that are, in my opinion, barely doorstop level stuff. Um, and so, you know, it's really a function of the individual authors uh, more than it is a commentary series itself. Because I've seen commentaries with just a wildly varied quality of, of authors uh, in the same commentary set. So that's, that's the problem with that. So for example, the pillar commentary on James is fine, but I don't know if, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that First Thessalonians is going to be fine. I, I don't know who did First Thessalonians, so I'm not, I don't know. But that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, uh, my apologies to everybody on, um, uh, you know, Shabir and I just don't seem to be on the same calendar page. And uh, I'm finding it extremely difficult to make progress uh partly i think if the chapters were longer it'd be easier for me but they're they're all based on uh you know a limited number of words so you have to be so very focused and 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 put so much effort into how you're expressing stuff and um you know I, you can all put the blame on me uh actually i'm the one that's that's pushed shabir as fast as we have gone but uh, you can put the blame on me because if i was if I was less busy, I would be able to be goading him along better. But uh, we both know that we've got to get it done soon. And it, it's not that it's that much work. It's just that it, it's that much uh, difficult work uh, to, to do that kind of, of very focused presentation. So uh, my apologies, but we're working on it. Okay? Yeah, I appreciate your time, James. Okay. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right, bye bye. All right, eight seven 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 five three 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 four one. Wow, the hour is going by. Let's talk with Manuel. Hi, Manuel. Hi, Dr. White. How you doing? Oh, not too bad. Good. Hey, I got a question. I usually get a knee jerk reaction from a lot of different people. I thought I'd ask you about because I've never heard from a. Well, maybe I have. I don't know for sure because I've talked to a lot of different people, but. John 20 and 23, mm -hmm. usually when I, when I put that out there, I usually get, you're a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> well, that's because the Catholics misuse it a lot. But, yeah, I, yeah it, is, it is a subject that there isn't a lot of discussion of uh, for that very reason. Well, I wanted to get your, you know, your view on it because. I would really like to know how what, what you feel about that passage or what because I've never really heard it from a reform perspective. Yeah. Well, um, there's there's actually a couple of texts that uh, say similar things toward the end of the Synoptic Gospels as well. So I, I take them all together that uh, that what's being referred to here is it cannot be. Uh, we'll put aside the what it can't be. It cannot be the concept of a priesthood. Um, any kind of sacramental uh, forgiveness system that, that is utterly unknown to the early church, utterly unknown to the apostolic writers, all the rest of that kind of stuff. The only way you can come up with something like that is if you throw the sufficiency of Scripture out and um, adopt some kind of oral tradition concept like Rome does, and so on and so forth. But my understanding of, of John 20 and the text in Luke where Jesus uh, breathes upon uh, uh, the disciples. Well, he breathes upon him here as well. Um, the, where he uses the terminology of binding and loosing. Uh, in, uh, I think it's what, Matthew and Luke, I think, are, are the two. Just off the top of my head, I'm, I'm not looking at it right now. But uh, my understanding is this has to do with the proclamation of the gospel, which is the focus of the majority of what... Um, uh, Jesus says to the disciples very briefly in these post-resurrection appearances. And specifically, um, in the proclamation of the gospel, we are proclaiming the forgiveness of sins. And if anyone accepts and believes uh, in that gospel, they receive the forgiveness of sins. Uh, but at the same time, if we proclaim the gospel to someone and they reject that gospel... Uh, then it is necessary to explain to them they will not have forgiveness and their sins, to use the terminology that 
is used here, uh, their sins are retained. Their sins uh, uh, stay with them. Krateo, I think, is the term that's used here. Um, there is no forgiveness when there is not an acceptance of the gospel. And I think it's also important to note that this also marks a fundamental um, dividing line in the sense that now that you have the resurrection of the Messiah, um, that to be right with God requires you to come to him on the grounds that he himself has laid out in Jesus Christ. That You can't have multiple ways. You can't have, well, you know, the sacrificial system is still fine over here, but, you know, and then you've got the Christian system over here, and uh, no, um, there is, there's one way of forgiveness of sins, and that is through the proclamation of the gospel, belief in the gospel, Rejection of that will mean that those sins will not be forgiven. They will be retained, uh, to use the term of, of John 20, 23. So I see all of them in, in light of the uh, power and the newness in the sense of the proclamation of the gospel, the resurrection of Christ, and the fact that this is the only way that uh, one can have forgiveness of sins is through that proclamation of the gospel. Um, so I think that's pretty much... Uh, the Reformed understanding. Uh, certainly, I think that's that goes pretty much in line with uh, with Calvin's interpretation of it anyways. Um, there might be some others that have a little higher church view, maybe, but I think it all has to do with the gospel. Okay, so you're, when you say proclamation, you're saying preaching the gospel. Yes, uh-huh. Okay, all okay. right. Would you, I'm going to ask you another question. You, you know, I'm one that, you know I'm a one that's Pentecostal. Um, no, really? <laughs> no, man, I, I thought you were an Episcopalian, man. That would have changed yeah, yeah. everything. <laughs> well, uh, would you say, you, you know what we believe about baptism? Mm -hmm. would, you, would you say that, that, would you call me a baptismal regenerationist? Um, well, in the sense that you make it necessary and it becomes the means um i've i've not really talked a lot with oneness folks about their understanding of regeneration i think there would be some because i don't i don't think you hold to to, to uh to total depravity in the sense that i do so i'm not really certain where the differences would lie between us as to our understanding of what regeneration actually accomplishes. Uh, and I don't think that's come up in any of the, well, just a couple of debates that I've, that I've done. Um, so I don't know that it's the, I'm not sure that would be the terminology that I would use, but it's certainly within that realm that there is a human action synergistically that brings about regeneration, then yeah, sure. But uh, I'm not sure. That, uh, it's certainly not. I don't, I don't think it'd be the same thing as, say, the Roman Catholic understanding of that. For example, I see a difference there. Yeah, it's not. It's not the same thing as the Roman Catholic understanding. And I actually, I don't believe it's possible for a one that's been cost to, to be a baptismal regenerationist. Uh, so you know. Why is that? I, I just, what's that? Why is that? Because we. We believe in calling the name Jesus over the person being baptized, and that's the most important part of, of baptism. And because uh, 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, he talks about all, Paul talks about all these sins and such were some of you, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We take that literally. We literally, you know, Acts 22.16, having the name invoked, you know, we take that stuff literally, Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. We believe it's the name that remits the sin in water baptism, not water baptism. So you, you believe that what's in first? So you believe what's in First Corinthians six is a reference to baptism? Yes, I actually do believe it is a reference to baptism. So everything is done there, including sanctification. Yes. It says that uh, you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That actually confirms Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
we can't be baptismal regenerationists because we believe reception of the Holy Ghost is different from belief. I mean, it's tied all together, but it doesn't happen at belief because Paul, in Acts chapter 19, verse 2, he asked hmm. disciples of John, whom he didn't know who they were, he said, have you, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? So that, that very question lets me know that by not saying, have you received Jesus as your personal Savior, that no, you do not automatically receive the Spirit upon belief, or Paul That's, wouldn't ask the question. Yeah. Yeah, well, see, where I, where I would differ with you is those those were those were disciples of John, and and there's obviously a translational issue as to how you translate the participle there, and their answer just simply indicated to Paul that they had not yet heard the gospel. That was that was the issue there. I think extending that out from there is is uh, an area of uh, of great disagreement yeah. between us. But I, I find that interesting, and man, I've got to get to one more before we get done with the program. So. Appreciate your phone call. I hope that was useful to you. Let's talk to, real quick, Reginald. Hi, Reginald. Hey, how you doing? Good. Go uh, ahead. <laughs> um, I have a question about um, how to engage with our younger um, audience of Christian uh, youth uh, with the changes in law and things like that, how we're kind of going into a, a nether nature of really combat with sin, not technically people technically, but... Um, how do we do that? Because I'm I'm seeing a more unprepared youth. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, that's because the adults. Uh, uh, well, I, there's a lot of sermons I could start here. I don't have time for them. I, we've all actually got to wrap up when uh, pretty much on time tonight. But um, th- we have we have far too long been isolating our youth from the mature adults putting them off in a little ghetto by themselves and entertaining them. Um, that day is gone. Uh, we must call our young people to maturity long before the culture around them matures. And I personally think that they respond extremely well to that. I certainly did as a young person when I was called to uh, grow up and be what I needed to be. Um, I responded to that. And we need to say to, to our young people, uh, there is a calling of God upon your life. It gives meaning and purpose to your life. It will have to. It will require you to, to love Him more than you love the world. You're going to suffer as a result, but this is why He's placed you here, and this is His calling upon your life, and this is what discipleship is all about. Take up your cross, join the death march, and mm-hmm. that's going to be absolutely a daily experience for all of us, but especially for young people. Uh, the days of entertaining kids uh, and and uh, letting them look like the world, think like the world, act like the world, and spread a little Jesus on them are long gone. <laughs> long gone. Uh, the, the, the churches that have filled themselves uh, with that kind of stuff will be the churches that are giving in right and left uh, and bowing that. the knee to Caesar over the next uh, couple of months, literally. We had a questioning... Um kind of a session in our youth group and one of the questions came up uh how do you evangelize someone who believes like they're a mormon or something uh maybe uh or they're involved in islam uh and how to answer them well you have to first know very well what you believe and you'd be surprised how many um young people i mean they have a very very thin ideal of what the gospel is oh i know i know and um we have not put them in good stead by allowing that to happen. Um, we need to call them to a higher level, not to a lower level. It is not a. It is a matter of helping them to realize that this is life and death. This is what they're being called to, and it's vitally important. Hey, Reginald, we're out of time. Thank you very much for your phone call Thank today. You. There's much more we could say on that uh, next week. Thank you very much to John Sampson in anticipation of coming in. I appreciate it. And... Uh, I may need to do something from up there just simply because I may want to be able to say something other than just a screen flow video on uh, what happens uh, in the almost inevitable profaning of marriage in our land. But we'll see. Uh, Remember, strangers and pilgrims, strangers and pilgrims. We'll see you next time. God bless.